welcome to the Marina Skewer podcast. It feels like ages since I've done this because the video I did in December was a little bit earlier in the month than I usually do just so that I could have it all up and out before I took a break over Christmas. And it was really nice for me to take uh, two solid weeks with the weekends either side um, off from work. So I still did a little bit of knitting and stuff because I love knitting in addition to work. Um, my husband had some time off too and it was really really good to just recharge the batteries, um, spend some time focusing on the things that we really enjoy and actually rest. I logged out of my emails and didn't look at them for uh, over two weeks and that was astounding. Um, and it does mean that I have a fair few things to show you in this episode and I'm really excited about it. Uh, so without further ado, first I'm going to talk about the jumper that I am wearing now, which if you watch the podcast or follow me on Instagram, uh, you will recognise as the Boscular jumper. Um, this is a yoke design I came up with using yarn from Garfenna Organic. Um, I have released the pattern this week and so you can see that it has contrast ribbing for the neckline and the cuffs and at the hem as well. And I really like this. I try, it's a thing I often try to do where I'll transition a little bit uh, using the colour work to transition from the main colour to the contrast colour. Um, and it's something I really enjoy. So with these little bits at the wrist, it's the same detail as at the hem. And it just kind of feels like these little sproutlets growing out of the ribbing. Um, so the jumper was inspired by uh, branches of trees and roots um, and the way they sort of crisscross um, and I spend a fair bit of time when I go outside these days I mostly go to the copse that is just a couple of blocks away from my house um, we live right on the edge of the city so it's really easy to get out into the countryside um, and I really like just seeing that change of how the trees respond to the seasons and the effect on the undergrowth and things and this was kind of that idea of looking up um, at the sky from under the trees and seeing all of the bare branches crossing over um, and I really like that I'm hoping to do more sort of nature inspired designs um, which you'll see in another couple of things that I'm going to show you so I really like how this has turned out um, I really just enjoy the way these colours work together, the way the slightly different yarns set each other off. So the main colour is this grey. Um, it's a Shetland yarn, um, so it's pure Shetland wool. It's an undyed colour. So this one's called Shale and it blooms really beautifully. You might see in certain areas that it's like a little bit fuzzy. Um, which makes for a really warm fabric, which has been brilliant on some very chilly days that we've had recently. Um, and that is uh, Garth Enor number two. And the contrast colour I used is uh, one of their dyed ranges of yarns, which is Pentland, um, which is spun to the same spec as the number two. So it's the same meterage per skein and everything. Um, but it's a Romney wool rather than a Shetland and it is dyed and so because it's a Romney which has a slightly different crimp structure to the Shetland and generally a longer staple um, and it's got a little bit of luster to it it makes for really nice crisp stitches which means that you get this nice definition but not as much sort of crisp definition as you would get from a worsted spun yarn for example um, and I really like how those two yarns work together and I'm really really into the grey and green combination at the moment um, I mentioned in the last episode that I've been working with a lot of grey these days and 
I never used to wear grey much, but I'm really, really enjoying it now. Um, partially because of having brown hair and my neutral, my go-to neutral used to be brown. Um, and then sometimes it ends up being a bit too much of the same colour. So the grey works as a really nice, cool neutral. Um, so this one is called Boscular. It's a silly word. Um, I think I talked about this when I talked about the jumper uh, a couple of episodes ago. Um, it's a made up word. And so bosky means, you know, woodsy and things to do with trees. And often when you get quite dense tree growth, um, and boscular is kind of the idea that like it's a circular yoke and it's just a fun way of making an adjective. Um, so yes, I enjoy a little bit of wordplay in my fashion names as well as coming up with hopefully interesting designs. You can see it's got a little bit of an Art Nouveau thing going on, which I'm really feeling at the moment. Um, so the pattern is on my website and on Ravelry. I will put links to both of those below so that you can find them. I'll also put links to Garth Ennell's website so that you can find the yarn if you'd like to make the jumper out of their yarn. Um, and there is a discount code running just now on the jumper pattern. So it's Hello Boscular. Uh, that will be running for the next week. So if you're watching this as I'm putting it out, then you'll be able to get the discount on the pattern. Now, the next thing is another design of mine. Um, this one is yet to be written up. I, well, I've written up most of it. I've got some final maths tweaks to do, um, increase rounds to calculate, and then I'll be sending that one off to my tech editor and then out for test knitting. And this is the Way Odd Jumper, um, which I started, I think, early December. And it was a fairly quick one um, because I was very, very excited uh, towards the end of last year at the fact that I could knit again without um, having to be too careful about injuring my wrists because um, yeah, it's just nice to be able to knit for more extended periods of time. And so I got quite carried away and cast on lots of things and abandoned everything else while I made this one because I love it and I got it ready, um, so that I could wear it at Christmas. Um, and so you can see, if you are familiar with my patterns, you might know the Wayard hat, which has the same motif. And then, again, we've got different motifs at the cuffs and hem. And this time I have not used the same one for the cuffs and hem. They're different motifs again. And the ones on each cuff reflect each other. So that little sort of branchy pattern goes out from the centre on both cuffs. Um, which is a fun little detail. Um, it's got a folded over neckband, which means it's really nice and squishy. This one is in my Mendip DK yarn. So it's the natural sheep colour, which is the grey, and then dyed beech, uh, which is this uh, sort of brownish colour. Um, so I will talk more about that one when I'm ready to release the pattern, which is likely to be in probably about three months given testing and editing timelines and everything. Um, I never thought before actually becoming a knitwear designer how long goes into preparing patterns for hand knitting. Um, it's a lengthy process and I like to give my testers quite a decent amount of time. Um, I'll obviously give less time for things like hats because I mean, I, I can knit a hat in an afternoon if I'm going for it. Um, but then things like a jumper, I want to make sure that people don't feel too panicked about it. Um, and so, yeah, it, it ends up being from something being 
finished uh, as in you can see the jumper and it is done and wearable to actually getting it to a point where it's ready um, for anyone else to make it is quite a long time um, but yeah it's all part of a process that I really enjoy now next up is one that I had considered for a while like I had vaguely seen the pattern and thought that's quite a cool idea but then never really thought I'd make it um, and then I, I sort of just bought it and made it on a bit of a whim over quite a short time period and that is the framework bralette I'm never sure if it's meant to be bralette or bralette um, who knows uh, so this one I have made in a single skein of uh, Ginger Twist Studios Masham Mayhem DK in the colour It Might As Well Be Spring. That is a fair mouthful. Um, but I really like this sort of gentle turquoise colour. Um, and I knitted, initially I knitted the pattern exactly as it's written. Um, it's a very, very helpful pattern for beginners. Um, the designer is Jessie May on Instagram. Um, she's got a lot of really cool, like, basics but interesting. Um, and she caters to a really wide range of abilities and sizes and things, and it's brilliant. Um, so I made it as is. I then tried it on. Um, and I want to be able to wear this as an undergarment. Um, so something that is actually going to provide some support. Um, there are plenty of people on the Ravelry project page who it, it seems to do that kind of thing for, but then I think a lot of people wear a layer underneath it that adds the support. Um, I wanted it to be supportive on its own. So what I ended up doing was picking up the ribbing um, it's actually right on the edge here, so you can't see where I've picked it up. Um, and I then used all of the remaining yarn to knit additional ribbing. Um, and I turned that into an elastic casing. So I left a little portion open and I threaded some really thick, like I don't know if you can see here, but that in there is all some really thick stretchy elastic. Um, I happen to have that anyway because of the leggings that I'm making and I bought a little bit more than I needed um, so I had some of that just kicking around the place um, and I had just enough yarn to get the casing to the width that I wanted for this elastic and I'm so so glad that I did that because it means that as well as being a sort of pretty under layer now um, it, it means that I can make more of these and gradually ditch the underwire, which is going to be fun. And also the fact that it used a single skein. I realise that's not going to be the case for um, people who are bigger than me, because I tend to knit a fairly small size of things. Um, but the fact that I can get one of these out of a single skein of DK is really really handy because I have a lot of odd skeins of DK yarn lying about the place that I haven't otherwise thought of projects for. Um, so I'm very pleased with this. Oh I said I knitted it as is without modifications. I did adjust for gauge so I knitted it at a much more dense gauge than the pattern called for uh, because it's a DK weight yarn and I I wanted a fairly solid fabric that wasn't going to be sort of see-through. Um, so I knitted at the suggested needle sizes but ended up with quite a lot more stitches um, per 10 centimetres or four inches however you're calculating. So I made, I think I did one size bigger. Not sure, my notes are on Ravelry um, if you are able to use Ravelry and I will link those below. Um, so yes, highly recommend this pattern. Framework bralette and definitely going to be making more. Um, right, that's it for the finished knitting projects. 
I also have just here, um, I'm gonna see if I can do this all in one go. Right, here we go. Um, I did some crochet. I haven't crocheted for years. Um, and I just kind of decided that I had this massive ball of super chunky BFL yarn. Oh look, I haven't woven that end in. That's terrible of me. Oops. Um, I've been using it since and haven't noticed because it's been underneath. Um, yes, this is a yarn base that I used to dye back when I got yarn from wholesalers rather than sending wool to the mill to be spun up myself. Um, it's a super chunky blue face Leicester. Uh, so I just crochet it sort of freehanded this and winged it as I went along. So it's a little bit wonky because I don't 100% know what I'm doing with crochet. Um, and made this sort of basket thing. It's basically just, I have a lot of projects that I, they have various bits and I don't want to put them in a bag because then I can't see what's in the bag. And so I'm, I'm moving towards baskets for projects. Um, and you'll see a bit later on, I'm going through a big basket phase and it's loads of fun. This was just the beginning of that. Um, and yeah, so it's a singles yarn, so very loosely spun, um, which I then crocheted up into this thing in the round and then partially felted. Um, I'll show you very quickly how that process looks. Um, I do that quite frequently with things like um, house socks from Chunky Yarn. I like to felt them a little bit and agitate them um, just to get a more dense fabric. And the idea is that the sides of this now stand up on their own. Um, I would have liked it to be a little bit taller, um, but I used up all of the yarn and that kind of feels great. I'm deliberately sort of not showing you what's in here because it's a swatch for a future design, which I am very excited about, but I'm not going to show you yet because I still have some things I need to work on on it. I can show you the colors. Um, these are my Mendip four ply yarns. Um, so this, both of them are the stormy base. Uh, this one is beach. So that's the same color as was on the contrast color on the whale jumper. Um, on the stormy base, it ends up being a little bit warmer than on the DK base because the DK base is gray and the stormy base for the four ply is a sort of beige color. It's a mixture of all of the natural Shetland colors. So it's a warmer color to start with, which yields a slightly warmer color um, in the finished yarn. And then this one is teal, which is, I mean, it goes, it's very much in this sort of color family. It's a bit darker, but I'm, I'm definitely, um, I mean, not much orange, which I think a lot of people will be surprised with, but I'm going through some phases with color at the moment. Um, so this one's going to be a color work one. I love a bit of two shade color work. Um, and yes, these yarns are available on my website. I will put a link to those below. Pretty much everything I talk about um, that there might be a link to, uh, will pretty much always be in the description box below. Um, if there isn't, and you would like more information about something I talked about, please do always ask because I'm happy to provide it. And it's often the case that I have just forgotten to copy the link into the notes. Um, and I always want things to be as helpful as possible. Now, this next one, um, is a sort of mid stage finish thing. Um, I recently have really been enjoying um, what I'm calling multi-stage textiles or crafting, um, sort of the idea of slow textiles. And it's something that I'd love to hear from more people about. I'm really liking the idea of taking a fibre through multiple stages of processing 
um, to create something from it. So not just, you know, buying yarn and knitting it, that's loads of fun and I love it. I'm more and more interested in um, processing and getting the fleece and then washing it and then dyeing it and then spinning it and not necessarily completely end to end. So not, you know, going from fleece straight off the sheep's back to finished garment. Um, although that is something that I am planning to work on this year um, as part of the fluff to stuff. Um, I think, are they calling it a make along? I'm not sure. Um, fluff to stuff 2021 uh, is run by some friends of mine. Um, Mars of Hay Brownberry, Grace of uh, Babbles Travelling Yarns and the podcast, and Mina of Knitting Expat um, are running a make along to encourage people to use their hand spun yarn. And I'm planning to be a little bit extra about it. And I'm hoping to film a, a little series over the next year of shorter videos. Um, each just showing a single stage of a, pro a project. So um, I'm soon planning a little video on washing some fleece and then I might do a video on dyeing it and we'll see how that progresses. Um, but eventually that will be something that I spin and then make something out of. Um, I'm still in the planning stages so I don't want to say too much um, this isn't endorsed by them, by the way, it's, um, they're running the make along and I think it's a really cool idea and I think it's nice to set myself some challenges and it'll be really nice to share more of the things that I personally find interesting with you and if it's stuff you're already aware of, I'd love to hear any uh, input or opinions or advice you might have or if it's, if you like to buy yarn and then knit with it, um, great, and you might learn a little bit more about what goes into how yarn is actually made. Um, yes, after that little ramble, this is the outcome of the weaving I was doing in the last video before Christmas. Um, so the warp yarn, which you can sort of see in these tassels here, uh, is a dark sort of aubergine purple colour and then the weft I used is a fairly bright sort of cherry red. Um, <laughs> the weaving took forever, I was so done with it by the time I was finished. It was by far the longest warp I've ever woven and it was very fine yarn um, and I just hadn't accounted for how slow that was going to feel. So it was on the loom for much longer than I expected it to be. Um, having said that, now that it's actual fabric, I'm so pleased with it. I'm really, really happy about it. So if I show you, I'll unfold it all and make a big mess. Here we are. Um, now, even though it's very fine yarn, um, this is a fairly sort of dense fabric now. Because when I took it off the loom, I had the same problem that I had had with uh, the fabric that I made my skirt from. Um, if you go back two episodes, I think, um, I, over the summer, wove some fabric out of the same yarn I used for this for warp, but then a Raimi weft. And it ended up being a fairly loose fabric and I sort of resigned myself to that and I wear that skirt with a petticoat and that works fine. With this one I wanted to make a dress and I don't want to have to wear something underneath it and I didn't feel like lining it because I sort of, it's a very arbitrary thing but I sort of really like the idea of it all just being handwoven fabric by me and I'm not going to be able to weave the kind of fabric that I would use for a lining on the loom that I currently have. Um, so it, this fabric has quite a bit of body because I decided to really go for it with the wet finishing. 
For those who don't know, when you finish woven fabric and pull it off the loom, it tends to be very crisp and quite often quite open. Um, you've got gaps between all of the yarns um, because it's been at such high tension while you've been weaving. Everything is sort of all spaced out and a bit tense and scrunchy. And so to turn it into actually nice fabric, at the very least, you will, I mean, it depends slightly on what fibre you're using, but for wool, for example, you will soak it in hot water and then sugar it up a bit. Um, you can finish it to various degrees depending how much fulling you want. So fulling is that idea of the fibres fluffing up and mushing together a little bit. Um, I did what I would usually do with this, sort of similar to what I did with the crochet basket. Um, you know, soak it in hot water, scrunch it up a lot, throw it around a bit, and that sort of process eventually leads to felting. But doing it by hand is incredibly laborious and takes a long time and you often not get uh, a huge amount of change unless you're actively there felting it for a very long time. With this, because it's such a lot of fabric, um, I finished my usual wet finishing um, and once it was dry, it was still quite open and it was like, I, I can't wear this um, as a garment fabric without something. In. It was like a layering thing. So I decided to be a bit controversial and chuck it in the washing machine, not on a wool wash or anything. Um, and all of that heat and agitation and tumbling and everything because um, in the UK we don't really do top loading uh, washing machines, everything's front loading. Um, and if you have a lower spin rate in the washing machine, rather than, like if it's really fast, you get that sort of centrifugal thing where everything sticks to the edge and goes like this. Whereas if you have a slightly slower spin, there isn't enough speed to make everything stick to the edges and so it sort of gets up to here and then falls and does like this and that leads to a lot more agitation. That's what I did with this and now I mean it's super dense fabric. Um, I lot because it's wool therefore it shrinks. I lost 25% of the area of the fabric and I'm not even mad. Um, it's it's just a lovely fabric. It's almost like a boiled wool now, um, so it's really thick and warm. And I'm going to make a dress from it, and it's going to be glorious. And I'm very excited about it. So I think I will probably end up making a video about uh, the design I come up with for the dress and the actual process of sewing that dress uh, for my patrons, um, because I tend to do slightly more in-depth detailed videos over on Patreon and that's really nice. I mean the subscribers over there mean that I have a little bit more time to focus on projects that I find really really interesting and can hopefully share more about but they allow me a little bit more creative freedom which is fantastic. Before I show you the things that I am currently working on I'm going to enjoy a cup of tea and I'm going to show you some of the glorious frost we've been having recently.
first work in progress I'm going to show you uh, for my knitting is one that has been going since before Christmas um, but I sort of abandoned it to finish the whale jumper. This is my Snowland cardigan. Um, I am, well I have really been enjoying it. Uh, the yarn is much softer than I tend to use um, just because I happen to have these two yarns in my stash that complemented each other very well. So it's actually got uh, the colours alternate every row, except for the ribbing at the hem and the button band where it's just the solid beige colour. Um, one of the yarns is a hand spun one and one is a mystery one that might be merino. I believe it's naturally coloured, uh, just by the look of it. Um, naturally coloured merino isn't super common, um, but this is very soft and not super washed. Um, and I've got definitely a yarn chicken situation going on, which I had always planned for because I, <laughs> I tend to make a lot of modifications to things just based on the yarn that I have. I very rarely buy yarn specifically for a project. This was one where I happened to have two yarns that I felt like I could compare, in, compare, combine into a garment. Um, so one, you can see I've got the teeniest amount left. Um, one is a hand spun uh, blue face Lester combined with an art bat and the other is the merino beiginess. Now you can see I have the teeniest amounts of these left and I am working on the cuffs. Um, I haven't yet started the ribbing because I'm going to work until I run out of the hand spun, still alternating every round. And then when that is done, I will use the remainder of the beige. It might be that I end up with very skinny ribbing for the cuffs. I think I'm okay with that. Um, it's something where I'm going to do it, see how I feel about it, and then I might need to rip back. Generally, I do not like ripping back at all. However, in this situation, because I want something that I'm really going to like, um, I, need, I just need to sort of see how it's going to look. And it might be that um, if I don't end up liking really skinny cuffs, I will rip back a bit and I might try doing the ribbing in both of the colours, or I'll just have slightly shorter sleeves. We'll see how it goes. Um, very much up for winging it. So I did the neckband uh, a fair bit skinnier than is called for. Uh, I think I did just over half the number of rows um, just to get everything I can out of the yarn. Um, this is going to be really really comfy and I'm excited for more cardigans in my wardrobe because I really like wearing cardigans. I just don't enjoy knitting them as much as I could, possibly because of all the faff about neck bands and stuff. Um, I am going to show you my little bag full of buttons here with some of the ones that I've been choosing from. This is a nice little bag of handmade buttons that my mother gave me a few years ago, which she got local to her in Argentina. Um, there are three different sets. There are these square ones, which are rather fun, made of wood with a very pretty grain pattern on them. Um, I'm not sure what wood they are, I would like to know, um, but I don't think she knows. And if I asked her now, she certainly wouldn't remember. Um, if I put those there, then there are these ones which are antler and I think those are so pretty. Um, they're just really really nice, they're very rustic and you can see, oh just dropped one there, <laughs> you can see they're really thick so they're quite heavy um, and so I think both of those will be suited to something a little bit more heavyweight and rustic than this cardigan. I mean, it's it's hardly city chic, but um, I think something like a really 
uh, chunky Aran weight jumper with a lot of texture to it. I think they would work really well with something like that. The buttons I am considering are these ones, which are just little simple round wooden ones. Um, and they're very pretty. They're a nice, warm, slightly dark colour. So if I get a couple of those, I can show you. I'm not 100% convinced. I think what I'll need to do is sew them on and see if see how I feel about them. Because I think they might be a tiny bit too orangey. If I put those on there. Now, I think they could be really nice. They might be a tiny bit too big, considering I've got slightly skinnier button band than I had intended. It will be all up for me to just sew it on, see how I feel about it. If I don't like how it looks, I can get some other buttons and find another project for these ones. And that is fine. Um, I will want them to. I mean, to be honest, if it gets to the point that I actually do decide to sew them on, I will almost certainly never get around to replacing them. I think we tend to notice our own button choices a lot more than anyone else does. <laughs> um, but yes, I, th I think these will be nice. Right, now, that one I expect to finish this weekend um, and to be wearing it fairly soon. It might require a bit of faffing with. Um, we'll see how it goes. And... Yes, I look forward to seeing how the buttons do turn out. And next work in progress is this one. Um, this is the last thing I'm going to show you that I'm actively knitting at the moment. Um, this is the beginnings of a pear rock shawl, which is a pattern I released back in November. Um, and because at the time leading up to the release of it, I wasn't able to knit much. The sample for that pattern was knitted by Eula of Wool and Twine, um, which means that I haven't actually knitted it. It's the only one of my patterns um, that I've self-released so far that I haven't knitted myself. And I, someone saw the shawl that I was wearing and liked it so much that they have asked uh, to commission me making one out of my own yarn. So this is one that I am making out of Mendip DK. This colour is Plum, which is this really rich sort of royal purple. <laughs> Loud cars outside. Um, is not a colour that I would usually use in large amounts for my own things, um, but it's really nice to be able to use colours that I wouldn't necessarily knit for myself. Um, and the border of the shawl has a contrast colour and so I'm going to be using the sky colour. Um, so both Mendip DK, um, which gives a really nice bouncy rustic thing going on and it does make for a really big comfy sort of uh, wrap around shawl and I think it's going to be really pretty in these colours and I'm very much enjoying this fairly straightforward lace. Um, bits of it do require a bit of concentration just because of the placement of these diamondy bits. Um, but it's just really fun because I was, back last year, um, I was making a shawl out of hand spun yarn just a triangular shawl, so the same sort of construction as this one, um, but just in garter stitch, because that was when I was just getting back into knitting. My hands couldn't really cope with anything uh, complex, and having a slightly heavier weight yarn meant that the stitches were easier to form. That served me really well. Um, I enjoyed that for the process of getting back into knitting. Then it got to the point where I was able to knit slightly more interesting and complex things and I gave up on it entirely intentionally. Um, I decided that the project had served its purpose and that I didn't need to continue making it. Um, which is 
quite interesting because that's not usually how I approach making at all. Usually I'm very much a product driven knitter. So I knit things being excited about the thing they will become um, rather than simply for the, the enjoyment of knitting itself, although I do very much enjoy the knitting. Um, but that, it just got to a point where I was like, yeah, thank you, Shawl. I'm not going to finish you. I'm going to frog you now, but thank you for getting me through a time. And it's been nice to have that as a little sort of interim thing, just to enjoy forming stitches out of some really nice yarn. Um, and then that yarn is still there for if I want to make something out of it in the future. And on that note, I'm going to show you something that I'm about to start. <laughs> Just today, in the post, arrived some beautiful yarn from Emma of Woolly Mammoth Fibres. Um, so these are three different colours. So you've got this one, which is a Dorset. Um, this, which is a Jacob's yarn which is actually the same yarn as is in the fabric of the dress I'm wearing underneath this jumper. Um, back in the summer I wove this fabric using this yarn and some of my own naturally dyed Mendip 4-ply um, and made this fabric and then turned it into a dress. And then this one is a new limited edition that she is going to be releasing soon I believe. Um, and I am going to be working on a design with these yarns. And these ones, there is a difference in colour, so this one is a bit darker, but I need to check within context of the design that I'm going to be working on whether the difference in those yarns is enough. So I'm going to be doing some swatching and it's going to be really enjoyable and I'm very much looking forward to this project. Now you've probably noticed that I do have quite a lot of projects on the go. Um, that is because at the towards the end of last year um, I did a fair bit of thinking and planning um, about where I'm going with Marina Skewer because um, around this time of year I do always like to think and plan and make goals to the extent possible where we can't really tell what the near future is going to look like. Um, so I, up until now, well recently, tech editing has been a core part of my business. Um, it's been a fair chunk of my income. Um, I haven't talked about it much on here because I haven't been taking on clients for ages and it's he's just not well I don't know but it's not super interesting for podcast content I think I'm not sure uh, correct me if you think that it's actually fascinating um, and I have for a while been at capacity so I haven't been taking on extra clients and towards the end of last year with more design work and more uh, dyeing and sending out yarn and everything it ended up that I was over capacity and so this year I'm going to be scaling back on my tech editing um, so I'm still going to be working with some clients but not as many um, which is a slightly difficult decision and a little bit scary um, but based on the fact that I'm doing more designs people seem to like them um, I'm really enjoying uh, focusing more on the creative work uh, and the fact that I have a lovely group of patrons who are willing to support what I'm doing um, means that I can make that decision to focus a little bit more on my creative work so that will mean that I have more time for knitwear design and more time for making videos. I have some goals set on Patreon so that um, when I have quite a few more subscribers I'll be able to do the podcast more frequently You've probably seen I'm not short of projects to talk about um, and I'm also planning additional videos for uh, just more um, process based things. I know that a lot of people enjoy the making aspects of my podcast and seeing 
uh, my actual hands working and seeing what I'm doing. So I'm hoping to do more of that to sort of celebrate more of the small scale personal textile crafting. So yeah, little update on what I'm planning and what I'm excited about. And with that, I'm going to show you uh, something that has really inspired me over the last couple of weeks. Now, I mentioned that one of the things I particularly enjoyed about the break I took over Christmas was the fact that I allowed myself a bit of time to play and try some new things. And one of the things I realised is that if you're not looking to make yarn for knitting, but are instead looking to make a uh, string or twine that is useful for other purposes, you can make it out of a lot of different plants. And I had always thought for fibre and textile uses, that you sort of had to use things that were sort of well recognised for that purpose. So I use a lot of wool from sheep, which is has been used for centuries, millennia. Um, and then in terms of plant fibres, things like flax have traditionally been grown, and I have done a bit of flax processing and would definitely like to do more. Um, and they're recognised because they have very specific properties that make them good for making fabric and things that we wear. But I have been interested in finding out a bit more about plants that grow locally and aren't necessarily cultivated. And that led me to reading a bit more about nettles, which I knew could be used for, for fibre. And last summer I had hoped to do some work with nettles and never got around to it. Um, and I was just doing a bit of reading and came across um, the idea of making cordage, which is a way of twisting fibres together to make string or twine or rope. Um, that doesn't require any tools, you just do it with your fingers. And I came across a couple of people on Instagram um, one of whom is Foraged Fibres, who I think is up in Cumbria, possibly. Um, and the fact that she has made cordage out of all sorts of different plants, and that inspired me to go out into my garden and see what I could try. And that has led to a bit of a brief obsession um, with trying out different plant fibres and has made walks out in the countryside, which at this time of year are often a little bit depressing, that it's quite muddy, um, there isn't much green around, and things are generally quite brown. Um, but I went into my garden, I found some nasturtiums, we grew loads of nasturtiums over the summer, and up until recently they hadn't died off um, from the frost, they were sort of clinging on with the last bit of green. And we also had some really tall hollyhock stems, um, which are definitely dead, but are still standing. And I decided to try twisting those into cordage, and I ended up doing so, and made this tiny basket. Um, it's kind of adorable. You can see it's very, very small. I use it for keeping pencil shavings in. Um, I've got my sharpener in there, and it was just really fun. It's the fact that this is something that I have made out of plants that I've grown myself, not even for this purpose, um, and it's really enjoyable. And so the nasturtium stems I used whole, uh, so I didn't split them or anything. Um, and. I soaked them. Generally, I think the best way to uh, twist things into cordage is to let them dry out almost completely um, because they can shrink and then re-soak them a little bit so that they're a bit more pliable and easy to work with. Um, which is what I did with these. With the hollyhock, I got it much finer um, and twisted it into some fairly fine and very strong um, fine twine. Um, the nasturtium is not strong, 
uh, is not something I would recommend. But I think hollyhock is something that has been used in the past uh, because hollyhock stems are very strong. Uh, and that sort of just led me on to seeing what other fibres I could find. So on walking home from New Year, we went out for a walk, all distanced and everything, with some friends. And on the way home, I stumbled across some cordyline leaves that had fallen from the tree. So that's the Torbay palm. Uh, it's one of the palm trees you'll frequently see growing in the UK because it's quite winter hardy. Um, and it has these really long leaves and a lot of them had just fallen onto the pavement so I scooped up a load, my friends thinking I was slightly mad, um, brought them home and the next day I split them all down into these finer fibres and these are very strong. Um, and I realised that I wouldn't even need to twist these into cordage to use them. And so I then made a second little basket. <laughs> Now this is a case where I think I slightly over soaked the fibres and then I didn't use quite enough of them in the basket and so I don't know if you can see but it's a little bit wobbly. Um, however, it is perfectly serviceable. This is a different style basket um, to the other one. So the first one is um, a sort of very modified version of a steak and strand basket which is something that I learned how to make on a workshop probably about four years ago. I do have a willow basket upstairs that I made um, and use regularly and that was um, at Farnham Maltings. Uh, I was taught by Judith Needham who is a very skilled willow weaver and a lovely person. Um, so that is a sort of modified version of a traditional willow basketry method. I think it's also quite common for things like split hazel baskets. Um, and then this one is a coiled basket, so you get bundles of the fibre and then sew them round each other in a circle. Um, there are some excellent videos on how to do these. I particularly recommend Sally Pointer, who does a lot of work with foraged textiles in the UK. She's up in, I think, Herefordshire. Um, and she regularly goes out what she describes as hedge bothering, which I think is delightful. Um, she has some excellent videos on making cordage and making things out of it. Um, so you can see it's quite wonky. It's my first ever attempt at this sort of basket. But you know, it's perfectly serviceable. And in here I have a couple of other attempts at some fibery things. So we have, first up is some willow bark cordage, um, which I'm making sort of gradually on and off. I, I sort of made as much as I could be bothered to uh, while the fibres were still damp and then they were beginning to dry off so I stopped and I need to start again once I've got them damp. So I can show you this. Um, now this sort of looks quite a lot like raffia. You can see this is very different to the split cordyline leaves for example. These are completely straight um, whereas these ones are a lot more pliable and sort of papery. Um, this would make excellent kindling I think starting a fire. Um, so this is a, quite a few strips of willow bark that I found on the floor on a walk and there's a whole process, if you're stripping bark straight off a willow, um, there's a whole process to get the inner bark separated from the outer bark separated from the wood so that you can take only the bit that you need for making cordage because the inner bark is the bit that's nice and flexible. However, this had presumably fallen off the tree quite a while previously, um, had sort of partially rotted down, and so the outside was already falling off, and so only the strong inner fibres stayed there, and they were still intact because they are much stronger, um, which meant that it was really easy to grab and prepare and split down. Um, and this is a really strong cordage, 
um, it's got really nice long fibres which help with the strength and so that could be used for something to bear quite a bit of weight. Um, so this has all sort of vaguely got me interested in um, sort of more bushcraft type making. Um, like I'm not at any point soon going to go out and make myself a shelter in the woods and Pinterest is now telling me how to skin a squirrel and things and I, I'm a vegetarian by the way. Um, I I don't want to skin a squirrel nor do I want to see skinned squirrels on my Pinterest feed but whatever. <laughs> um, but I am becoming a lot more interested in the fibres that I can work with that grow locally that are effectively free. Um, obviously gathering sensibly and responsibly um, only taking small amounts of things and generally where they're in abundance. So things like nettles and brambles are all over the place in the UK. They are both fibres that I'd like to try but haven't given a go yet. Um, another thing using the same technique for the cordage is that I realised that I have, well I have a fair bit of flax, um, I have both long line flax which is the entire length of the stem of the flax plant which is then processed so that the finished fibres you end up with are the complete length of that stem. Um, the byproduct of that is tow flax which is, that's T-O-W, um, they tend to be shorter pieces that get tangled or are um, improperly retted, so retting is the process of soaking the stems and the stalks um, either in, like just submerged in water, so often you used to get retting ponds, um, or you can dew ret, which is lying the stalks out on the grass or in the fields, and the dew in the morning soaks up into the fibres and gradually that breaks down, as I mentioned with the willow bark, it breaks down the outer fibres so that you can get at the stronger inner fibres. Um, if the retting goes too far and too much of the fibres break down, you end up with a weak fibre which sort of isn't really usable. If it doesn't go quite far enough, you get less fine strands, you get thicker strands, which aren't as good for things like fine textiles. Um, but are still very strong, very usable fibres. So I have a big bag of toe flax, which was given to me when I went to Flaxland up in the Cotswolds. Um, they are a fairly local to me flax grower and they're very, very knowledgeable. Um, I went on a course there and it was really, really interesting. Um, and because of this toe flax that I have a fair bit of and I can process it in various ways to get longer fibres and slightly shorter fibres and then really short fluffy fibres which I've often used to blend in with other fibres in bats and things and I realised that the long fibres are perfect for thread and now I'm gonna have to show you this close up because this is very fine um, it's very very slow and it's using exactly the same process for making cordage, which I will show you in a second with some of the willow. Um, and my idea is that I would like to make enough thread to sew something with. Um, ideally, I'd like it to be a project that is all locally sourced fibres and preferably ones that I've processed all of myself. Um, I could end up sewing my whatever I make for my Fluffed Stuff 21 project. Um, so the spinning and weaving and sewing thing that I'm planning on doing. I could sew that by hand with linen thread. It would be a bit of a feat. Um, I don't know if I'll actually have the willpower to make enough linen thread to actually hand sew a garment from, but 
it's something that I'd like to explore because I, I just love the idea of making my own sewing thread. It's incredibly dorky and very exciting. Um, and yeah, it's just very interesting to learn a bit more about how things would have been done um, long before things were mechanised, before um, very sophisticated tools were used. I mean, for this, you do not need tools. It's exciting. You can grab some kind of plant when out on a walk and just twist with your hands as you go. And my, I have fidgety hands. I use my hands for things all the time. You've seen that when I talk, I wave them about a lot. Um, having something to do with my hands while we're out walking that isn't tapping at things on my phone is really exciting to me. Um, so I'm just going to show you very quickly I will tell you that there are good tutorials out there on making cordage, but I'm very quickly going to show you how I do it, just so that you can see sort of how easy it is. Um, and I think different fibres um, respond differently, um, and so it can take a little while to find a rhythm, but I will just show you how I do that. So I have my little bundle of willow cordage here. Um, I've just got it rolled up on itself like this so that um, it's easier to manage because you end up with, I'm right-handed so you end up with a long length of it going off to the left um, and it's just easier to manage if you keep it bundled up. So you can see that this here, where my hand is here, um, that's the point where I have stopped twisting. And you can see these now are just loose, untwisted bark fibres. And so the way that you twist it, I generally keep my thumb on that point where the twist is. And I'm just going to moisten my fingers so that this is a bit more pliable. Um, and so you twist the strand that is furthest away from you you twist that away from you. Now that motion might not show up particularly well, but you're just twisting it until it almost wants to curl back on itself. And at that point, you bring it over the other one. I then like to grab it with my other fingers, moisten this one as well. And then the one that was nearer to me before is now further away. And I do exactly the same thing. I twist that one away from me. And then bring it over. And then that means that the fibres twist together. And you end up with a little bit of extra twist in the fibres here. And I feel like it's the sort of thing that everyone's going to end up with their own kind of rhythm for. Um, I do recommend that you give this a go. I mean, I've been trying it with things like um, dead leaves from spider plants. <laughs> um, you know, when you get the ones that uh, shrivel up and go brown around the edges when you forget to water your spider plant for too long, because I'm a terrible plant owner. I mostly have ones that are quite easy to look after. Um, in fact, I can show that to you. I've just got it here. I tried doing a double twist because I found that it was quite weak. So I did this and then I did the same thing but twisted it back on itself and just end up with this fun little bit, which is, I mean, there's a decent amount of strength to that. The, um, the original one that was just two plies together was not strong at all. Um, but yeah, our house just now has loads of these little random bits all over the place. <laughs> um, and, you know, a short piece like that isn't useful for anything other than me occupying my hands for a few minutes and trying something out. Um, but this willow cordage, once I've got enough of it, will be quite useful. It'll be strong. Um, I'll have to decide what ends up actually deserving handmade willow string. Because <laughs> that's the sort of thing, I quite like the idea that it, doing these things in a method that is very, very slow, 
kind of encourages you just to think about how things are made and the amount of work that goes into them and I feel like it kind of can help you just be a bit more conscious about the things you use and the fact that they, well often they weren't made by a person but just the processes that go into things and I feel like if I have more handmade things you just sort of consider what things are really necessary. And so it's a really fun process. Um, you can see that unlike spinning with a spindle or a wheel, uh, which creates a single and then you end up plying it back on itself at a separate stage, with this you are effectively spinning and plying at the same time. Um, which is really nice because, you know, you do this and then you have a little piece of usable string. Um, which is really handy for, you know, I'm hoping when the weather cheers up a bit we will be able to go camping again. And at that point, you know, if it turns out that we've forgotten string or something, you can just go into the hedges, grab some brambles or nettles. Um, I mentioned those two because they're very strong fibres and ubiquitous and um, generally it's not possible to take enough of them to actually make a dent in the amount that are there. Um, and obviously that's quite specific to where I live and your local plants might be different um, but generally there will be things growing about the place as long as you do have some kind of vegetation that can be used in this way and obviously this isn't something that I am particularly experienced at because I did it for the first time a couple of weeks ago um, but it is really good fun well I mean you know I say that it's a good thing to do with your hands while you're talking to someone or listening to something or watching something. It basically requires zero concentration other than when you need to add in a new uh, piece of fibre because when these ones run out um, you end up just overlapping another piece and twisting it in. Um, and so yeah. A, you can you can see there that it sort of twists back on itself. That's where I've got the... I've either got more twist uh, when I'm twisting the individual strands or I'm overplying it. I suspect that I'm getting less twist in the ply. And so what I can do there is go back to the stage that I had started at. Just unkink it like that and then just pull it out straight and then it ends up springing back on itself. You can see there, hopefully, there's a little bit there that's slightly thicker and that's where I've joined in another bit. Um, and you know, it's not perfect string, it's not particularly beautiful. Um, not going to win any awards for it, but it's a really nice thing to have learned um, and I hope you've enjoyed me rambling about that a little bit and maybe we'll give it a go yourself and if you do I'd love to hear what plants you've got uh, growing local to you that might be suitable. And so with that I am going to leave you there. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed this month's episode. Um, I will hopefully be seeing you soon. I'm fingers crossed going to get another little video out uh, between this and the next podcast episode. That will hopefully be on washing fleece so do keep an eye out for that video if you want to make sure that you know when I've got new videos out. Do subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell that means that you will be notified when I put out new videos and will also help other people find my videos, which would be really nice. And so 
I hope you've enjoyed this and until next time, bye bye. <music>